funny session late on a Monday. So I wanted to start before covering the the topics that I have for today to talk about exercise uh, set three. If anyone had any questions, I'm going to make some comments about problem two. But if you have any questions about problem one, you can tell them now. If you have any question or something that is not letting you sleep at night. Yeah? I have one question. Okay. For example, if the uh, end of life of the field is 36.5 years, can we assume that in our economical analysis it's 37? Yep. Mm -hmm. oh. That's okay. You can round up. Uh, formally, if you have time, but, but like in this case, you have to run many cases, okay? Yeah. So if you have time, you could exactly find, for example, the end of the plateau or the end of life. But if you find an approximate, they shouldn't change much just by a few months if you get a real date. Okay. Yes? There was like a significant difference. So one of our guests, we were like comparing the answers. Mm -hmm. But in that case, you still have to include the OPEX of the of the year, right? Yeah, of the year. So it's mm -hmm. better to round up like one year forward. Mm -hmm. That one year before. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not fair. Mm. Okay. Ideally, it will be just to find the exact solution. But if you want to save time, but that's something that you don't have to do when you are there in the field, okay? When you are there in the office. Yeah? Exact solution means that even the OPEX needs to be adjusted. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, better to do like it's better to do it like that, but if you want to, you know, speed it up to do it quicker because you have many cases, that's possible to do that approximation. Okay, but you have to compare on the same basis. If you are going to round up, you have to be sure the way you round that is not going to put someone in in disadvantage or in advantage compared to another case. Okay. Any more questions on this case? Are you getting what he got, this guy? Okay. That's what you have to to expand on your explanation. Uh, so if there are no more no more questions, really, this case we did it on class and uh, and what I uh, you also have to check is learning. We have this uh, feature called uh, forums that we put questions. You can put questions and we answer through it. And I think it's uh, all of you are using that are aware of that when it's learning. Yeah. So I think that's important because then we uh, avoid having to ask the same question many times. So you just go there and you check um, if the question has been already asked and you can check the answer. Uh, look, okay. There was a problem with one of the videos of class uh, 13, the class from previous Monday, where the audio was lost. So I have to check, I have to be a bit paranoid this class. Okay, then comes this exercise uh, that I'm going to go um, maybe a bit in detail about it. You have two templates, and in this case, you cannot simplify uh, the same the same way that we have done for exercise one. That we assume one well is representing all the all the wells in the in the templates. In this case, but something good is that we can take one well for each template, and that will be the representative well. Uh, so we have basically to reduce this system to a network of two wells. Okay. And so the first question was to say, okay, if I, they're operating in plateau mode, you have to produce a plateau of 10 million, and you produce until the end of the plateau, and from there, from that point on, you have to. It will, uh, the end of the plateau will happen because one of the templates. Well, it's already open choke, okay? You are opening uh, sli slightly the chokes of both templates, and there will come a point, either in template L or M, that one of them is already fully open, okay? But still, the choke of the other template is uh, negative. So that means that it has more flow capacity what it, than what actually is producing. So the, w the idea is to say, okay, if I leave the production this in open choke of that template that is weak, 
But then of the template that is very strong, I go and I open the choke slightly to compensate for that, for that loss in production. So that's a uh, question, I think the question was number one, or question A. Let's make a comment here. So you can simplify it, that's thank God, we can simplify it to two a system like that, with two wells and one pipeline and a separator, just exactly the same way that we have done in class, so that's why I told you that I'm preparing in that exercise so you can solve the exercise. Uh, so first you know that when they are operating in plateau mode, that the total production of the field, the gas production is 10 million. And you have to find a way, that's something that you define, and that's something that also that the reservoir engineer is defining, how much I'm going to produce from each well, okay? And I told you one way to do it, at the beginning you can say, run an open choke simulation, okay? That in a way you calculate there, remember that open choke all the time tells us the potential of the well that it can produce. So if I take this case for the initial reservoir pressure that was uh, 200 and something, remember from head from 240 and 210 okay so you take that case you put your IPR here 240 and 210 and you run an open choke simulation what open choke means that you have to calculate one way that I told you how to do it in class available pressure at the junction PJ from template this is template M PJ from template L, and then I calculate counter current, the PJ seen from the separator, okay? And remember here I have to use, because these are two parallel pipelines, exactly identical, so here I have to use half the rate for this pipeline. Hmm? So in reality there are two, and I have to maybe use one because they will be exactly identical, and I just say Q of the pipeline is equal to Q of the field divided by two. Yes? Uh, Question? For this open uh, network simulator, open shock, uh, there are two ways, but we don't know which one is the correct way. Okay. Or do we have to close or shut in one well and check for the other wells its maximum? No. Or both at the same both time? Both at the same time. Okay. okay. Because remember that one way to, s to split is what he said, that you shut down is like the example that we have done. We have the Q of the well 2 and Q of the well 1. And we run one simulation here, one simulation here, and then the simulation with open choke, okay? But really the potential has to take into account what is the interaction with the other wells in the system, okay? It has to take it. When you do it like that, you are basically assuming that the other well doesn't matter. It doesn't play any role in the performance of the other well, which is wrong, okay? Remember in networks, all the, all the time we have a hydraulic interaction between the wells. So we have to capture that. So we run a simulation exactly the same way we have done in class, and at the end you change the rates until all of these pressures are the same. That I told you how to do it, I had a method, you may might find another method. But of course you will find that the rate of the field at that particular time, let's call it Q of the field at, at the beginning, or we can call it I, okay? Field rate. at a, it was a 2009, right? The beginning of 2009. It's going to be greater than 10 to the 6, okay? Of course, because otherwise we won't be able to operate in plateau mode, okay? But what you are interested really is not on that rate, but it's on the split between rates, okay? You take the rate of template L at that initial time, or, or well, one well of template L at that initial time divided by the field at that initial time, and that gives you the split factor for well for for wells in L. Okay, and then you calculate um, again the same thing for M. Okay.
well actually we have one more step okay we have the rate of the template and then we have to divide by the to each well okay then we have to divide by this is the rate initial rate of the template rate of template uh, l at initial time and this is rate of template and at initial time okay so I'm going to use the same split the same split for I am saying this is a, this is how they naturally if I run the network with an open choke if they you know they will be a, I call it a fight okay there is certain competition of wells for the flow in the pipe for the flow in the system and they reach certain equilibrium that's how they are comfortable with because that depends, I told you, on the IPR, that depends on the well characteristics, on the length of the well, that depends on the diameter of the pipe, that depends on these distances, etc. And at the end, this is the natural splitting that they achieve well, after they, all of this fight. Okay? And we are going to say, well, I want to produce now the same 10 million, but split in the same way. Okay? Because I want it to be as close as possible to the real natural situation, just to scale it down. Okay? So I take, to find the rate of template I, I say 10 times this x l i, okay? And then I just divide by the number of wells in template l, okay? And m the same way. This is for our one well, okay? For well rates. And then I know how much each one is going to produce. I think the value is close to seven and three, I think. And the seven million and three million, it has a split between the templates. And you fix that rate and then you run, you fix the rate and then you run simulations in plateau mode that I guess you know already how that's done. We have done it for Snow White. You, do, you calculate the available pressure up to the choke of each well before the choke and you calculate the required pressure after the choke and then you just verify that that value is positive. If it's positive, it means that you have enough energy to produce the, 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 that rate. Now what happens, there will come a point in time where one of them is going to be, become negative. Okay, which one is it? Huh? M? Okay. So what do you do in that case? The idea was that I want to open the, the strong one to produce to compensate for what is not wh what the weak one is not producing okay so how do we do that in this implementation any ideas we can one proposal that i if i have here l and i have here m okay i know that the rate here i'm still operating in plateau Okay, that's my first assumption. So the rate is 10 e to the 6, and I can, can calculate the real junction pressure. When I have this junction, junction pressure, I can move, I can do two things. I can say, I can change this rate of template M, assuming that there is no choke. Okay, so I go all the way, I calculate the available pressure at the junction, I assume a rate, and I calculate the available pressure at the junction assuming that there is no choke. And these pressures, of course, PJ, M, and PJ are going to be different. So then I change this rate until I get exactly the same pressure. That's, that's one way, you can do it any way you want, okay? But that's the way that I see it, uh, yeah, I, I mean, more logical to me at least. And then you obtain that these two pressures are the same, okay? Now, the rate of L is just going to be 10 e to the 6 minus this rate that you found of M, right? And then you fix that rate, and then you do ca co-current calculations all the way to the wellhead, and counter-current calculations from the junction, and then you find the delta P of the choke. And that choke has to be positive. In the next time step, you will find again the same issue, one negative, one positive, and you do the same thing. It's only when the two of them are negative 
that you have to solve again the network, they won't be producing 10 to the 6 anymore, and you have to go to this case that we presented before. We have to assume the rates and make that all the pressure at the junction seen from M, seen from L, and seen from the separator, they have to be the same. So we calculate the hydraulic equilibrium. Hmm? Just one practical, um, so if you see here, we are the rate that we are calculating is only valid at that particular point in time. After you start producing, it won't be valid anymore. So we are assuming basically a rate that is non-feasible for that whole year. Okay? I'm not sure if you, you're following. You have time, you have QL and QM, okay? And you have zero, one, two. I think the problem starts at year six or five, something like that. Six, okay? So here I began to have a problem Okay, that the delta P of the choke, L and delta P of the choke, this one becomes negative and this one becomes positive. So when I calculate the real rates, okay, now I calculate the real modified rates, okay, no longer with the split, but another split, QL and QM. They are going to be valid only for that particular point in time, only for that beginning of year six. After that, 6.1, 6.001, they are not going to be valid anymore, okay? That's something that we have to live with, okay? Otherwise, we have to do an implicit solving, and we have to use the trapezoidal rule to calculate cumulative production, and it becomes complicated, okay? That really, in essence, is the same thing that when you have reservoir simulation, when you're using a reservoir simulator, and you're using, is called explicit coupling. This coupling that we are doing is explicit because you find the rates and you assume that you can produce through the next period of time, okay? Uh, that's explicit. It's called explicit coupling, okay? While there is another way that you solve, you put the trapezoidal rule and then you solve the system of equations at the same time and you find exactly what is the rate that you can produce and you do just a better approximation. Instead of a flat from year to year, you have the rate and instead of having a flat, profile to try to approximate this, you try to approximate just with a line, okay, or just with a, 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 a straight line. And that, oh, that really, when you are working with separate models, reservoir and production models, that creates a lot of problems, because you have to solve a lot of system of equations. You have, let's say, a, a reservoir model that has million cells, and you have a production model that is very heavy to run with a lot of wells, and when you try to solve all of them exactly and find really the exact solution that you know that is the true solution, it's usually very time consuming and it's very complicated to set up. So that's implicit coupling. Okay. But luckily, you know, we have a workaround that people saw that if in explicit coupling, if you use a very small time step, okay, maybe in the in the order of month, then the two approaches will give the same result. So that's something that you have to take into account, those of you that are going to work, and it's something that is becoming more and more popular. Okay, people like to have couple models, they say that's best to capture the interactions or the real performance of the production systems. So you will have, probably very likely, you will deal with some of these issues in the industry. Okay, so explicit coupling, Okay, and here we're talking about months, okay? Not years, like what we are using. It's more or less equal or gives the same results. That's implicit, okay? And it's much easier, it's much easier to set up, it's much easier to maintain. You don't need to have so many communication and transfer of information between the two models. Some cases we cannot avoid it, we have to go for an implicit approach, but that's something really nice that people found out, and it's exactly the same way you're doing in class. The same way that you're solving the exercise is exactly the same way. You assume that you will be able to produce that rate along, you know, uh, during the next uh, time period. Okay, now uh, any more questions about pre question A? Yes? Yes? 
Up here? Down here? Okay. From here to here? Yes. For template, so just to, maybe you came a bit late, I think. You you put 10 million, and then you calculate the real junction pressure, okay? Because it's producing in plateau mode. So that's the real pressure that you're going to have at the junction, okay? Then you assume a rate, QM, that it could be, remember that's QM, we have been producing in plateau rate, and then you have to decrease it. So a good guess is to use a rate lower than what you have been using before, okay? So you assume a rate and you calculate the available pressure, junction pressure seen from M or seen from the weak template, okay? And they won't be the same. PJ from M won't be the same as PJ calculated from the separated. So you change this rate, you, know, you change this rate until these two pressures are the same. And after you have that, then you have how much M will be producing and to calculate how much L will be producing is just 10 minus M. Okay? And then you calculate with that rate all the way to the wellhead, available pressure at the wellhead, and then you calculate the required pressure from the junction with that rate that you calculate QL. And if that gives you positive, it means that you are choking the well to keep that production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but here we are assuming, remember that when we do our approximation, we are saying that this will take the rate of one single well, single well rate, and this will take the rate of the template, and this one will take the rate of the field. Okay? We have to take, because that's a simplification. Really, we have seven wells, but we are simplifying that only to two wells. Okay, because of symmetry. We are lucky in this case, and because of symmetry, we can do it. Okay? Yeah? And, uh, once, once you get uh, the junction pressure and uh, the spread among the template, uh, when we are going to calculate now the, the end of plateau, uh, that is the junction pressure is going to change. Uh, actually, no, because the rate all the time is the same, 10 to the... For example, I found that I calculated the spread by not using that rate, but using another rate. Yeah, it shouldn't change because this pressure is the same, and you have the rate. Remember that here, to calculate this pressure, you use line P1, and line P1 depends only on C flow line, that is constant, depends on P2, which is constant, and depends on the rate, which it also is constant. So it shouldn't change. That's my... Mm, so maybe you have to check your results. Actually? Yep. Uh, in real life uh, development, it means that if we have more lines from the uh, junction to the separator, we can extend our uh, plateau? Yep. Remember that when you put parallel lines, it really is helping because you are, it's like creating less resistance, okay? If you have here a source, and you will, let's put it the other way, that's a source, and that's a sink, okay? It's like you put only one line, okay? Then you will have the resistance of that line to overcome. If you put exactly one line that is identical, then you have two paths to go. So you are actually, the rate through each one of them is going to be less. So the pressure drop should be less. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Maybe one sentence in the exercise. Maybe I can't understand. It says the production of each template can be modified towards the end of the plateau such that the whole fields will reach the end of plateau at the same time. Does it exactly? Explain? Well, it's actually exactly that that process. That initially I have the two of them producing a fixed constant rate. This is, by the way, this is very convenient because the reservoir management only gives one value. Okay, you don't have to be changing it every year. Okay, you just say I want this well to produce this value and it remains like that until I begin to have problems. So that's a very convenient uh, way to operate. But you will see you produce these two 
for a certain time, and then you find problems in one of the wells, okay, that it cannot produce. So you have to reduce the rate of that well, okay, but then you increase, you compensate with the other template because you still have a positive delta P of the choke in that well. So that is actually doing that to be able to produce for more time this 10 million, 10 to the e to the 6. Well, it's not a plateau, it's like um, they, in that way, when you're reducing the rate, you are prolonging the, it's like, well, maybe it's not properly phrased. It's like you're prolonging, you're prolonging the total plateau length, okay? Prolonging the total plateau period by uh, reducing the rate of those wells that are, uh, that have problems and increasing the rates of those wells that don't have problems. Maybe that's how it should be phrased in the exercise. Good to know for the future. Any other question? Hmm? Yes. Uh, we have the two pipelines, so we will assume that the storage from the two tanks will be evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. So it's not like that the, the one line is only for the east tank and the other for the west tank. No. Uh, in that case, I think it was in that particular, this is Gulfax, okay, the Gulfax field. I think initially it was like that, that you had two lines, each one for for two separate templates, but then they decided to put the tau head and then they joined them together. And the reason is because they are going to put a compression. We will see now in, in, uh, in uh, maybe in two weeks, we will begin to see compression and we will, ex we will see that issue because they had to commingle the production from the two templates to put the compressor. So that's why they have put that structure. Okay. Any more questions? No? And then the second, is it worth to look at the case B also? Yeah, or, or not? Okay. The case B is you run an open choke simulation in every time step. Okay, you have time. Okay, so you run a open choke first before doing anything, you run at that time with the reservoir pressure of L and reservoir pressure of M. You run an open choke network simulation. And then you will find, for example, that the Q of the field initially was, I think it gives like 22 and then begins to decrease, okay? 18, year one, year two, and something like that, okay? That gives you a QF that is greater than 10, 10 million. And you calculate the split factors Calculate the split factors XMI and XLI. Okay. And you do the same, you do kind of a reassignment of rates in every time step. Okay. And really reservoir, this is very useful for network because people that work with production, they understand how the network is working. But for the reservoir people, they don't understand why we have to do this change with time. They don't like it so much, especially when they don't know where is it coming from. Okay. You're trying to redistribute in every time step, so because they're going to decline at different rates. Okay, They have first different pressures, they have different properties, different volumes, different material balance. So they're going to decline at different rates. So the split is going to change with time. And by using this approach, we are redistributing the rates depending on how the two of them are depleting with respect to the network. But maybe the reservoir engineer has already found that a better approach is to, if I want to achieve certain recovery factor, I want to drain exactly this value, I have to chain exactly in certain uh, way, and they don't like this approach so much, okay? But this is the approach that should be used, and this is the approach that is actually m s most production simulators, they have this approach built in, okay? So you calculate the split factor and you re-split, calculate, template rates at each time step. Okay, and when it's the end of the plateau, you just run the simulation and you will see that the rate of the field is less than 10. 
is 9. So in that case, you just continue in depletion. Any question about this approach? So you have to all the time try to kind of have not a fight but a discussion with the reservoir engineer if they are going to ask you or you maybe you're going to be the one asking you're going to be the reservoir engineer trying to argue that you want to recalculate or you want to redistribute the rates because of the network okay sometimes the network is not a big issue but like in this case that the two templates are very different and they decline differently so it's very important to to take this issue into account Let's see if there was something else to, to consider here. Um, yeah, you see, you will have to use, when you are in plateau, and also in this case, you have to use very much the solver. Okay, so that creates some issues how to create the layout of your Excel sheet in a way that people correcting it can understand. That's me and the assistants, okay? and also that someone else can take it over okay so you have to find a way how to do it in a smart way okay so you can understand you know exactly what you're doing because you have too many available and required so you have you will probably will face some problems okay trying to organize the data and you also that's why I put on the excel sheet of uh, problem one you have a way to run the solver from a macro so probably you will have to use that. It's very useful instead of having to run for 20 years or 17 years that you have to run it manually every every time. Okay, so I also encourage you to, it's worth to look into it. Maybe it doesn't run at, at the beginning. You have a lot of issues, but then after it's running, it really saves a lot of time. And it's a learning that you can have for the future later. Okay. Yes, uh, any more questions? Now exercise three, uh, I'm not sure how I can discuss this exercise without uh, giving you too many solutions, but we can make a small comment. For this exercise, there is no fixed solution, right? Hmm? There is no fixed solution. Which one? Uh, problem three. No, there is one unique solution. One unique solution. Mm -hmm. Yes. If, if, we will, if we will solve the problem two with, the, with both uh, parts A and B, mm -hmm. should we get the same result? No. Actually, the profiles will be. Well, you will get the same plateau duration, okay, the same plateau length, but the rate of each template won't be the same. Okay, one approach time QL and QM, okay. Let's put uh, QM in blue. <coughs> So QM will be like that, and QL, I don't know, will be something like this, okay? Then you begin to have problems with M, and you begin to decline, and this one begins to increase, to compensate, okay? Until here, you reach the point where this is already open choke, and cannot produce anymore, you cannot sustain any more 10, and the two of them begin actually to decline. Completely different, so that's one case. Okay, this is one and the other. And the other case, that is, this is case A, okay? A. And case B, I'm not sure exactly how it will look like. Yeah, but it, I'm not sure which one is increasing, L or M? Hmm? Okay. Okay, so probably this one will look something like this and something like that. Okay, until they enter into the client. Okay. But the plateau period for both should be the same. I think so. Mm -hmm. But A is more practical, right? In real life. A, yeah, it's more practical. It's more practical for implementation, okay? The operator, when they go to the well, they just measure the rate and they make sure that the choke, they be open and open and open the choke, okay? This one, you have to provide a rate. You have to go back to your reservoir people, say, okay, how much should I produce this year? And they give you a value and then you put it. Then the next year and then next year, okay? So in, in implementation, this one is more practical than this one. 
So here we can put reservoir engineer is happy, but the production engineer is sad. Okay, and this one reservoir engineer is sad and the production engineer is happy. Okay. But that's life, okay? Just uh, you have people that are happy, people that are sad. So. if to make a comment or it's going to confuse you so I will risk it then they give the same result they why the two cases give the same plateau length anyone has any idea or an intuition or something This because the IPR, like you well said, but maybe let's try to phrase it slightly. IPR of each well is just a function of the cumulative production of GP. Okay, which is to say also that the flow potential uh, potential is just a fun function of GP. Okay. If in real life, like you said, if you are producing, for example, more from this well, maybe you will have coning sooner. Okay, maybe you will have that it becomes to to come a lot of liquid or a lot of water. Okay, in that case, this operating is going to tell you all the time the well is going to produce less and less. Okay, because maybe it's producing a lot of gas, and then you have coning, or then you have some other issues. You have blockage of liquid in the well, and then the productivity decreases. But we are not taking these issues into account. We are just saying that it only depends, the productivity of the well only depends on what I have produced so far. It doesn't depend on the history or it doesn't depend on the rates that I have been producing. While in real life, sometimes that plays a role. In real life, the well potential is actually a function of, of the cumulative production, but it's also a function of how much I have produced so far of the key of the will in time. And for that's the reason, that's the motivation to have more realistic models, a reservoir model and production network, because sometimes that happens and we cannot capture that with a simple material balance or with a simple IPR. We have to be able to see how is the flow of fluids towards the wellbore, and what is that causing in the productivity of the well? Hope I didn't confuse you, but. By the way, it's not that we just, you know, you say, okay, these guys all the time saying that this is a very simplified approach. So we just should, you know, nothing that we are learning here is going to be applicable. Actually, it's the opposite. You all the time begin with a very simple case. You see how, what you have to solve in the simple case, and then you go and move to a more complicated case. And sometimes, really, the conclusions that you get by doing this analysis, they are completely applicable in a case that is more complicated. And if you understand how that works, that's really very, very powerful, okay? Okay, problem three, uh, just very briefly. So we have a CR PR this is one minus PWF one it's Q one Mm -hmm. Yep, and the SNL. Thank you. Okay, so that's the equation, the IPR of each layer that I am providing. Some they determine with uh, it might be with well testing or might be with uh, they have the the logging and then with the thickness and the properties they can more or less estimate analytically what's going to be the productivity of each layer. And then you have, in each section, you have here, let me just maybe put it to the right. 
okay you have in each section you have one section here that you have how was the equation of the tubing any of you can help me q3 equal to ct to three p over s over yes and this is p wf three squared minus p wf two squared like that sure okay so you have this equation for this flow then you have another equation q2 plus q3 equal to ct between 2 and 1 uh, so here the flow is to the power of 0 0.5 yep exactly uh, then we have pwf2 over e to the s okay this s is going to be different Let's put S1 and S2 minus PWF1, 0 0.5. Okay, so this is this tubing segment, then this is this tubing segment, and at the end you have the last tubing segment, which is Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 equal to CT from 1 to wellhead, PWF1. And basically those are all the equations that you have. So you see really that you have PWF1 in three equations and we have PWF, sorry, uh, one, two, and three, and one, two, and three. Okay, in two, in five equations. So that's actually what you have to find a way, it's a bit tricky, but you uh, you will manage uh, to, find the to solve the system of equations, to find the solution. Okay, then we uh, we took already one hour, so we just take a break, and then we come back to the, for the second part of the lecture. A any other question before uh, we close? No. Okay. Uh, hello. Yes. Return. Uh, one thing that might be useful, yes. Remember that when you do equilibrium. It has to make sense what you're doing, okay? It has to make, remember that there shouldn't be a jumping pressure unless you have a choke, okay? So, and usually the choke, as I told you, we, what we do is that we take it out of the system and we calculate available and required, okay? But the system has to be, there has to be continuity of pressures in the system, no matter how you calculate them. There are many ways you can put your equilibrium point, many, as many, as many as persons we have in this world, but at the end, your own method, the way you understand it, it has to make sense. Okay? The pressure has to be continuous unless you have a choke. And you have to be, if there is nothing, available and required should be exactly the same. If there is something, then they might be different. But if they are positive, means that you have the choke for the choke, it has to be all the time positive, And for a pump, it has to be all the time negative. One question that was, I think, maybe good, good to comment was that if you have here the junction, okay? And then you have two flow lines that are identical. And you have P of the separator here. And really, formally, if we wanted to solve this problem, we have to apply equations for each line, okay? CFL1 and CFL2. So, and why, so people were asking, why do we have two lines? Why is that? Because of picking, okay? We, we, Remember that we want to send the pig through one line and return it and receive it from the other line, okay? And the pig also, if you see the pig, the pipeline cannot be different size, okay? They have to be the same size, the test and the production line. So if you already have two pipes in place, why not to produce from both of them when you're not doing pigging and when you're not testing? So that's the kind of the, the thinking here. You have two lines, they have to be there to do pigging, they have to be there to do testing, but they are exactly the same size and I can use them just to just to produce my field, okay? When I have to do peaking, then I put all the wells to one line, or I close the wells, and then I, uh, when, I, when I want to do testing, I put all the wells to one line and leave only one in the test line. When I want to do peaking, I just shut in every well, 
and then I I just you know do picking. Yep. So here the equations are: you have Q1 and Q2 of each one of the branches. Okay. So Q1 equal to CFL1 times P junction squared minus P separator squared to 0 0.5 and Q2 CFL2 P junction. Okay. Remember that they are departing and arriving at the same point. Okay. So reality, I should put these two equations and solve them. But the thing is that we know that if they are identical, exactly the same, why the rates should be different? So I'm saying Q1 equal to Q2. So then I can add up and CFL1 equal to CFL2. So I can add up these two equations and I get 2 Q of the field divided by 2. Okay. And here I get 2 CFL PJ squared minus P separator squared. And then I can just say that these two, they cancel each other, and I get the equation that we were using. We just use one equation to represent two flow lines. Well, actually, I'm telling kind of a, but that's maybe outside of the topic of this course. When you have transient multiphase flow, usually we might have the same situation in a riser. You have the templates, and they the production is commingled, then you have a pipeline, and then to go all the way to the platform, there are sometimes people use two risers, okay? They have one and then the other. Because, as I told you, to reduce the pressure drop. And in that case, you will find some problems that all the flow likes to go to one side rather than the other. But this, we are not concerned about these kind of issues. But just to, to to make you aware that, that that cases they exist and it's called riser splitting rate uh, rate splitting unstable rate splitting in risers okay a big issue and people are doing a lot of research on that, but it's outside of the topic of... For that, you have to use uh, transient simulators, multi-phase simulators, and but just to let you know that sometimes nature is not so simple, just to split evenly, but you have these, these kind of funny things. Okay, so any more questions? No? Okay. Um, I think what we have seen last class was uh, multi-phase flow. I hope you got an overview of how do you do uh, multi-phase flow calculations. And in most cases, that, that process is done by the, by, the, by the software, okay? That's done by the program. But it's important that you understand roughly how they are done, especially some cases I, like the case that we were discussing, okay? That you have a well, you have the tubing, And we were calculating wellhead pressure. I'm not sure if you remember last class. But we were uh, PWF versus Q. So I think that we assumed the pressure here, uh, flowing bottom hole pressure. Then from the IPR, we got a Q. And then we wanted to find out what it will be the pressure available at the wellhead. Okay? But it might happen when you're doing this integration. Remember that we had to split in intervals. And we were doing pressure drop calculations uh, along the well bore, along the tubing. And it might happen that at some point, then we get a negative a, a pressure value that is negative. Okay? That might be possible. So what happened in that case? Uh, the fluid can go up. Actually, then the rate that we assumed is too high. Okay? The pressure that we assume here is too low. So it won't be enough pressure to deliver that rate to the surface. 
in that case what do we have to do we have to that will be like how does how does the available pressure the wellhead performance relationship looks like like that okay right everybody remembers from that old time some weeks ago okay the thing that happens is that actually we are assuming a, a rate that is on this side the rate that is I cannot physically produce okay so in that case I have to reduce the rate and then try to do the calculations and these are things you might find in some software especially in HISIS this is an issue that we have to put initially the pressure uh, big enough to be able to flow the rate and then we can reduce it to to get exactly the rate that we want okay negative you put uh, constants <laughs> okay like uh, well one simple example I can I, I think I don't have any equations here to show you but the usually do I have or not yeah let's say that the delta P it's um, let me see if I have some pictures Okay, we are back. <laughs> okay, we have an expression that looks like that for the mechanistic model. And then the density that you are going to use is the density of the mixture. Okay, that depends on the holdup. As I told you, it's uh, holdup, liquid holdup times the density of the liquid plus one minus the holdup times the density of the gas. Okay. And yeah, that's also here. So what you can do is just just like an example, okay? That's not actually what, what the simulators are doing, but you put a K here, or you put a K1 and K2. Okay, and then you try to tune exactly with the data that you have, you know the pressure drop and you have the rate, you know exactly the pressure drop that you should get. So you change these constants until you get exactly the same value. Okay, it's just, the so the, uh, how to how to match your question is how to match a field measured data okay pressure drop data to a mechanistic model And the answer is, you stick constants, you stick tuning constants to your expressions, okay, of pressure drop, and then you try to tune these constants to the data that you have. As simple as that. Sounds a bit pirate, okay, but uh, but that's what the industry is doing. And it uh, really has some fundamental idea that if we are assuming or we are, for example, calculating a holdup, okay, certain slip between the phases. We are saying the velocity of gas and the velocity of liquid is like that. But in real life, maybe we have a bit more slip, a little bit less slip, because, for example, the properties of the fluid, they play a big role. Or we are not capturing certain phenomena that we should be capturing with our equations. So this K really what they are doing is adjusting a little bit this holdup 
to obtain a result that is closer to 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 what we have. And this the same is the same procedure when you have correlations. Usually the correlations they also have a constant and they use to change these constants to get a match with the field data. Okay, so it's just like that. I think it's uh, Prosper Petroleum Experts 5, I think. That's mechanistic. They have, um, yeah, we are going to have a session on Prosper later. I can show you on, on Prosper. Okay, any question? Okay, just to show you, uh, there is also another, let me just connect to VPN. They have to have access to the license. And let's see, I think. Okay, like Olga, the same tool that we were using last class in Excel, they have also got something called the point model that is what Olga's steady state is using. Okay, we're exactly the same. You can put all the just the same way we have done in Excel. Okay, we I'm going to put some data maybe here. One, refusing. Okay, the data that we have been using last class, I think, was something like that, 90 degrees, the roughness, one e to the minus five, pipeline length, I say 10 meter section, that doesn't matter too much, we want the gradient, the pressure is 200 bar, the superficial velocity of superficial velocity of gas 0 0.02 uh, superficial velocity of oil 1.5 superficial water velocity there is no water actually we can select here that we want only two phase okay pressure 20 e to the 5 gas density, that one we have from our uh, property calculator. Uh, I think the values might be a bit different from last class, I think. But you get the point, you here you can put all the, it's almost like a calculator, but for this one you have to pay a lot of money. You have to pay actually an Olga license. But it's doing exactly, well, not, maybe you won't get the same result, but it's doing, ex it's the same principle. Okay, surface tension. Okay, and then you calculate. Okay, and you see you got some other information. Uh, you got the, the volume fraction, okay, 98, 98% uh, uh, liquid. You got the pressure gradient total. Uh, is um, for nine. Uh, you got also the the different components of the pressure drop. I think here you have the gravitational, which is most of the most of the losses. If there is any slug, it gives you some details about slug, and also gives you the flow regime. And in that case, Olga is using. I think I have it uh, on the here. Okay, it has its own uh, system. Okay, by numbers. And depending on the number, you can say if you are stratified, annular, slug flow. Anyone here has worked with Olga before? No? But if you see, it's exactly the same, the same thing that we have done last class. Let me take a screenshot of that. How are you going to use it? Hmm? Olga. No. No, for that, you have to go to the course that I told you last time. Uli Jorgen. Sorry. It's also not the main, uh, not the main objective of this course. Okay, 
but it's exactly the same. It's also called a uh, multi-phase toolkit, but we call it also the point model. And why point? Because we're calculating pressure drop exactly at one point. It's the same thing that we have done last class. We're calculating delta P, delta X, local rates, local properties, and we're calculating at that particular point the pressure drop, multi-phase pressure drop. Okay, I think we can, uh, I'm going to, to discuss a very small thing and then we can just leave early today. I think uh, we leave most of the, what I want to discuss for tomorrow. So the, the, in reality, the tubing performance or the tubing uh, pressure drop curve, okay? If we have, we are doing bottom hole equilibrium okay we have available bottom flowing bottom hole pressure that comes from where from the IPR okay so that looks something like this that's our IPR and I, I'm not sure if you remember but how how it looks like the required if you say that I have a certain wellhead pressure okay if I fix the wellhead pressure how the required pressure curve looks like okay looks like that okay but that's only be careful because that curve looks like that only if we have a single phase that means if I have liquid or if I have gas Okay, when we have multi-phase flow, actually it looks a slightly different. How does it look like? Anybody has any idea? Okay, first, first going down and then going up. Those of you who took, I think, production wells, you should know, you should have seen that. I guess so, right? Okay, so it, it looks something like this. This is for multi-phase that means either we have a lot of oil and some gas or if we have a lot of gas and some oil or if we have the more or less the same between the two usually typically it looks like that first going down and then going up and that's because of what okay we say we split this in two regions one of them is gravity dominated and this is friction dominated okay remember that there are two components that cause a pressure drop one of them is the gravitational okay is due to density and then we have something that is called due to the velocity due to friction okay in this part the frictional losses are more important than the than the than the gravitational part and in this part the gravitational are more important than the friction but why it goes down Okay, we have losses all the time, but why it's going down? Because yep. the gas fraction is increasing. The gas fraction is increasing, and why the gas fraction is increasing? So what you're saying is from 1.1 and 1.2, how does the cross-section look like of the pipe? For 1 and for 2. Uh, more area for the gas. More. <laughs> for two, okay? So we say that this is the area of the gas and this is the area of the liquid. And here we have that this is the area of the gas and this is the area of the liquid, yeah? And that gives you more or less why it's going down, the, the pressure, okay? But why, so why, now I'm asking even more in detail, why this happens? <laughs> It's, it's a bit a bit a mixture of all of that when you have low velocities of oil then 
the oil is almost like flowing, it's almost like a static, okay? It's like a static column. And then the gas can go very quickly, it percolates, it's almost like it's bubbling through the liquid, and it's going very, very quickly. And that happens that when it's going quicker, it means that the holdup is going to be, the holdup of liquid is going to increase, okay? The cross section that is passing through is going to become smaller and smaller. But now when the rate of oil begins to increase, then you begin, the velocity of the liquid begins to be relevant or or how do you say, more comparable to the velocity of the gas, okay? So it, they begin to, to play each other and the holdup of the liquid is going to decrease, actually, because it's flowing quicker. So more or less in a very simplified way, that's what's happening between point one and two. One of them, the gas, the liquid is going so slow that just the gas percolates and goes very quickly. But then when I increase the rate of the oil, then the oil goes quicker also. So the holdup, the area that it occupies in the pipe, it becomes uh, smaller and smaller. Okay? Yeah, so that's, why, that's how the curve looks like, usually for multi-phase, and the same way that we have seen for single phase, this is done for a certain wellhead pressure one. Okay, if we change the wellhead pressure, If we change the wellhead pressure, then you will have a family of curves. Wellhead pressure, which one is the biggest wellhead pressure? The one at the bottom or the one at the top? P wellhead pressure one, P wellhead pressure two, P wellhead pressure three, and you're saying that? because you have more pressure required. If the pressure is higher, then you have to overcome a larger pressure at the, well, at the flowing of the bottom hole to overcome that, that uh, okay? And they also change with, they not only change with the wellhead pressure, but they also change with the amount of liquid, the GOR and the water cup, okay? There is also a change and GOR, okay? You could say if there is more gas, then the shape is going to change, okay? And let's say, yeah, I, I don't, I didn't bring a picture, but uh, I can find maybe for next class. They depend, they depend, they depend on all the properties that we mentioned last class, the inclination of the pipe, the pipe diameter, the fluid properties, they depend on all of that, okay? So they will change and be different, and that's very important because, for example, the wellhead, of the well might change with time, but also the water cut and the GOR, they might also change with time, depending on how much, what fluid is coming out from the reservoir. Uh, yeah, just before we go, one thing to let, to maybe you already noticed that, but it's good to call your attention about it. When you have the IPR and the tubing, the TPR looks like that, you might have this situation where you have actually two intersections between IPR and TPR. Is that correct? That really happens. Yeah. Hmm? Sometimes some people say we try to start the well and then the well goes, it shuts in automatically. Then we start again, it begins to produce and then it it's shuts in automatically. These two points, they are two equilibrium points, okay? But one of them is stable. And this is unstable, okay? And you can say the analogy that stable is like if you put a ball and you put it at the bottom of a, of a container and it's going to stay there no matter what. Remember that we are not producing a constant rate, okay, from the well. All the time, if you measure the rate or if you measure the bottom hole pressure, it's not going to be just a flat line, okay, like I wanted, but it's going to be, it's going to have perturbations, okay? depending because of the fluids that come from the world change slightly or that you have changes due to multi-phase flow for any kind of reasons, you will have changed like that. But if this change happened, then this point is going to stay all the time in the same place. When these changes happen, this is like this situation, when it's on the top of a hill. If you make a small perturbation to this wall, it's going to fall either to one side or to the other, okay? 
And if you, that comes for, for between, for the intersection between the equations, and when you program that and try to solve the system of equations, you have to put an extra logic to take care of that, okay? But if we, if we are going to look at it graphically, okay, let's say if I have a perturbation and that, hap that causes that my point will go a bit to the right, okay? The required is greater than the available at this point. Required is greater than the available. So what the world has to have has to do to to kind of go back to equilibrium, you have to reduce the rate, right? So you have to move in this direction. If the required is more than the available, I have to reduce the rate. Reduce the rate. And I go back into the equilibrium. Uh, equilibrium position. Now what happens if there is a perturbation and now the point falls a bit to the left, okay? Here the available is greater than the required. So what happens, the well could produce more and that's actually what happens, the rate increases, increased rate. And when the rate increases it goes back to the same point, operational point. So if you have variations, okay, going a bit to the right, a bit to the left, a bit to the right, you all the time end up in the same point. It's not going to fall outside of this point. That's why I'm saying by, equili by a stable equilibrium. If you're in this point, however, what happens? Here, the required, at this point, the required is greater than the available, okay? So what has to happen with the rate? has to decrease and then you shut in the well then the well stops producing Q is reduced and the well stops producing and in this time if I in this place if I now make a small perturbation to take it to the right here the available is greater than the required so the rate has to increase, and then I'm going to move towards the equilibrium, the other equilibrium point. And that's actually what people try, when they try to operate these wells, they try to give a push, or they try to put a pump, or they try to put a perturbation that will push the operate, that will give kind of a, a, how do you say, an impulse to the well to take it to this operational point. Okay, they know that this could happen, so they put a pump or they put something that helps that gives uh, an extra push to the world to take it to this equilibrium point. Okay, and this is something that you have to be aware of that sometimes might happen. You will you don't understand what is happening there, so you plot the two curves and you see the intersection and then you see oh, ah now I know what's happening. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, if, if you, if you, what happens if we put the choke here? How the, how the curve is going to change? Just the well head, okay? The well head is changing. So this might be for a, I don't know, 80% uh, closed choke. This might be for a 100% open choke. Okay? So really what changes with the choke is just the, the well head pressure. Any more questions? No? So we stop the session for today and uh, tomorrow we are going to continue a bit more on the technicalities. There is one thing that we haven't done any comment about and it's about uh, flow tables. Flow tables is something that is widely used by reservoir simulator people and it's also used, you will see, by production, by production simulator simulation people. And it's very important to understand how these tables are generated or how these tables are used. Uh, and after that, we are going to take a small look, I hope, to the black oil case, okay, because we have done last class with compositional. And really what you use, the most common approach is black oil. So you have also to be a bit aware of what's happening behind scenes when you use black oil. Uh, and that's, I think, what I have for tomorrow. And... Um, yeah, and then we start, I hope we can start with optimization tomorrow.
okay so thank you for your for your attention